Better? Oh, boy. It's good to see you. I'm happy to meet all of you, and it's a privilege and an honor to be invited to share the Word of God with you. In our first presentation this morning, we'll be talking about the biblical teaching on the doctrine of final punishment. As I mentioned last night, this all came out of the preparation and the writing of a book called The Fire That Consumes, which is on the picture there. And uh, I've forgotten the exact years this occurred, but somewhere in the later 1970s, I was actually hired by an Australian ex-Seventh-day Adventist theologian to do a research project to give him the information to decide whether he should reject the doctrine he had grown up with as a Seventh-day Adventist. And in the course of things, uh, I actually changed my mind from the view I had grown up with to almost the view he had grown up with. Uh, and he was uh, he was pleased, I think, that there was one thing in his background that he could hold on to and feel it was proper. He, I asked him what did he want me to do, and he said, basically, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want to know everything in the Old Testament about final punishment. And then everything between the Testaments, from the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then everything from the Gospels, and then look at what the cross may say on this subject in the death of Jesus, and then everything in Paul's writings, and then everything in the rest of the New Testament, and then the Apostolic Fathers, and then the Latin Fathers, and then the Antinicene Fathers, and then the later Christian writers, and the medieval theologians, and then the Reformers, and then the modern theologians. So I said, well, sounds like I've got my work cut out for me. And uh, that took a while, but uh, not knowing, like Abraham, not knowing where he was going, uh, I started walking and uh, eventually got to the other end, I think, and then I asked his permission to write a book. And my thoughts were, on the one hand, I've got to write a book. I've been so blown away by what I found that I did not know before that I have to share it. And then I would think, on the other hand, well, I can't write a book and say this. My name will be mud for sure, and it's already muddy enough. And then I thought, well, I've got to say this because nobody's dealing with these arguments and passages. And if I'm wrong, somebody will write a better book and show where it's wrong, and that'll still be a good thing. Well, it's been 26 years, and although I'm uh, maybe sometimes stubborn and foolish and prideful and a lot of other bad things, I don't think anybody's written a book yet, although there have been about 15 books that I know of in uh, England and Wales and America and uh other places written in response to this book. I, I don't know of any of them that's really dealt with the material that's, that's contained in it. Basically, they just rehash the same things they were saying before and ignore the Bible teaching on this subject. In our presentation this morning, the two views of hell, by the way, was a later book that came, the first one came out in 1982, and the two views of hell came out in uh, 2000 from InterVarsity Press who wanted to present uh, the traditional view and this view alongside each other. So in that book, Robert Peterson, who is a professor of theology at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis and a Reformed Presbyterian, uh, defends the traditional view, and I present conditional immortality, and then each of us responds to the other person in that book. So it's a kind of a mini version of the big book. Uh, let me mention my website, which you see a moment ago, the front page of on the screen, is edwardfudge.com. And I had sent a number of books out here to be available for sale this weekend. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I think they're just about all gone already. But if you're interested in either of these books, uh, you can go to my website, edwardfudge.com, and it'll tell you how you can order them. Also, I do have a few other books out here that I invite you to look at, and the same thing is true of them there on the website as well. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is a quote from an early, earlier writing on hell from a Catholic uh, priest who's picturing someone in hell, and he says, The little child is in the red-hot oven. Hear how it screams to come out. See how it turns and twists about in the fire. It beats his head against the roof of the oven. It stamps his little feet on the floor. God was very good to this little child. Very likely God saw that it would get worse and worse and would never repent, and so it would have to be punished more severely in hell. So God in his mercy called it out of the world in early childhood. Well, that's an extreme kind of quote, and most Christian people who teach the traditional doctrine would probably say they don't believe something like this. 
But I just wanted to give an example of the kind of ridiculous things that have been said in, in defense of the traditional view. Uh, Isaac Watts, who later wrote, uh, wrote that he wrote a book actually with a title that nearly fills up the front page, uh, teaching conditional immortality. Earlier in his life, had also believed the traditional view, and he he wrote a hymn in his earlier life that uh, that included these lines: "What bliss shall fill the ransomed souls when they in glory dwell, to watch the wicked as they writhe in ceaseless flames of hell." Uh, a few years ago, after my book came out, uh, John Stott in England had written in a book that he held to this view. Clark Pinnock in Canada had uh, said he held to this view. F.F. F. Bruce in England had written a forward to my book, and many other well-known people had uh, stood alongside this. There was a book that came out by a, a, an Orthodox Presbyterian theologian named John Gerstner called Repent or Perish. And he was mostly mad at John Stott uh, because he was the most famous person that he knew had taken this view. But he, he talks about me all through the book. But in the course of his, of his book, he says things like this. Every true Christian is happy to think that at this moment there are thousands of people suffering in hell. And he says, if you love Jesus, you must love hell. And he just says horrible things. He calls John Stott the Pope of Evangelicalism and so forth. One, one other writer uh, reviewed uh, Gerstner's book, who agreed with Gerstner, but in his review of Gerstner's book, he made the statement, this book needed to be written, but it should have been written by someone else. It reads as though the author wrote it by dictating into a microphone every day, and he forgot each day what he had said the day before. Well, it is a rambling diatribe, and it's just a, 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 scre- a, a screaming kind of thing. There are some serious books and good books on the doctrine of hell teaching the traditional view. I think they're mistaken, but they are, there are some with good attitudes and with a, an attempt to deal with the scriptures. So I'm mentioning the worst ones, and I've been, I'm happy to say there's some better ones. But uh, today in this first session, what we want to do, next slide please, is just talk about uh, what the Bible teaches about the end of the wicked. And since I... Uh, I took nearly a 500-page book with 1,600 footnotes to go through that in the fire that consumes. Obviously, we're not going to cover the whole thing in 45 minutes, but uh, we'll try to summarize it. Then in the second session, we'll look at the traditional proof text for the doctrine of eternal torment. And in the third session, the history of the eternal torment doctrine and see where it came from and how it became popular in the church and why most people believe it today. So this is our roadmap for this morning. Next slide, please. In, the, in looking at the Old Testament, I, I, I want to look at it under three headings. First of all, poetic principles of divine justice. Next slide. There are many passages in the Psalms, especially, in the, and also Proverbs, but especially the Psalms, which give what I call poetic principles of divine justice. And we'll be looking at, at one example in Psalm 37 in just a moment. In these passages, the, the, the Lord says, uh, in these poetic passages, using metaphors and figures of speech and uh, picture language, symbolic language, he, he pictures and portrays in many different ways the final end of those who reject God. And it looks like, if you don't know better, that when you read all of these, that they all picture a time when the wicked no longer exist, when they're totally destroyed, annihilated, abolished, extinguished, uh, whatever word you prefer to use. But, they're, but, the, but it's taught in terms of picture language, and so this is an example of that. Psalm 37, do not fret because of evildoers, don't be envious toward wrongdoers. And then look at the words in bold, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green herb. Evildoers will be cut off. Those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. Yet a little while and the wicked man will be no more, and you will look carefully and uh, for his place and he will not be there. The wicked will perish, and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastors. They vanish like smoke. They vanish away. Uh, Next slide, please. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Transgressors will be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked will be cut off. Well, it just sounds like cut off, destroyed, vanished, and there won't be any more, can't find them. Well, these guys are poof, they're gone, they're, they don't exist any longer. And, and, and yet, when we think of this as a, as a principle of divine justice, we have to say when we look around us in the world today, that's not what happens. Uh, 